Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of Wine Library TV. I am Gary Vaynerchuk, Director of Operations here at Wine Library at winelibrary.com and I am very proud to launch what we think is the uh, first video wine blog. We've been talking about doing a blog here at Wine Library for a long time. Uh, we just realized that we had too much text out there between the website and pounding you with four or five emails a day as I know we are. It just became something that we thought a blog would just be another layer that you maybe didn't need. Well, as you know, technology doesn't stop and now we have video blogs and we feel like we've got something very special here. We think we've got one of the first video blogs in the world, and for wine at least, and uh, we're, we're excited. Hello everybody and welcome to Wine Library TV. I am your host, Gary Vay, Nur, Chuck, and this is the 300th episode. A little bit different than the intro we did 299 episodes ago. You know, I'm ecstatic to be here. I cannot believe we've made this journey. The Thunder Show has come a long way from where we've been to in early 2006, February 2006. It's a long, long time ago. I mean, this is a nostalgic episode. You know, when we did the first 100, ep you know, the 100th episode, we did some razzle-dazzle. When we did the 200th episode, a little bit more razzle-dazzle. But we're mature now. We've grown. We're grown-ups. We're serious. And this 300th episode is very special because you'll be tasting along with me. We've got the two wines that we've shipped out to everybody. We've got a little special champagne time to, you know, toast out this uh, wonderful and exciting episode. And I'm going to share with you what my favorite champagne of this whole last two or three years, pretty much the champagne of choice since we've done the first episode. So I'll share with that with you guys in a minute. Having fun pouring that right now. I mean, you know, really before I start, I've got to do a lot of thank yous because we would not be here without these items and people. And so right off the bat, I want to thank the first ever spit bucket because let's be honest, this spit bucket started it all. It's been transplanted by the far better, more wonderful, exceptional, spectacular jet spit bucket. But the first guy, he means a lot to me. He's a good chap. It's in Steelers colors. So that's why we got rid of it. But it made its appearance on the first episode and we have to thank it for that. I also have to thank, before I thank the Vaniacs and my family, a very special person. One that there would be no Wine Library TV without. And that gentleman's name is Eric Kastner. Many of you know, original Vaniacs, that Eric, who is now gonna sit with us, did tape many of the first, I don't know, how long, Eric? I'd say maybe 100. Maybe the first 100 episodes and kind of, you know, guide us along until the monster came along and pretty much knocked him out of his job. You know, it is what it is, but <laughs> I, I just wanted to have you on, Eric. Thanks, I appreciate man. it, man. It's a lot Eric is a, is a big factor, the gentleman that showed me YouTube and the SNL stuff, and really is no question in my mind as key to the success of Wine Library TV as anybody. So I just wanted to give him a little that, camera time. You would be a lot better than I thought you'd be. He didn't have as much uh, confidence in me as you know maybe I had in myself, but I appreciate that. Thanks, man, seriously. Thank you. You got anything to say to the Baniacs? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> now you see why I'm on camera and he's not. You know, it's, it is what it is. Um, you know, I just want to obviously thank my family. Uh, they've been tremendously supportive, especially my wife. Uh, it's lots and lots of hours between 10 p.m. and 2 o'clock in the morning that I was emailing all you Vaniacs back for months and months and still to this day do, and so she's got a ton of patience. Uh, you know, there's there's other people that I think deserve a, a little bit of credit. One of, one of the favorite people who I think has uh, brought a lot to this show has made several cameos as Darth Vayner is Brant Kriak. Um, you know, he's been a, a tremendous part of the show, and uh, I just want to make sure that he knows that we are in big support of him, and, and we thank him for that. And last but not least, all the Vaniacs to watch every single day, five days a week, soap opera style. I mean, this is a big journey for all of us. We're changing the wine world, and really, in reality, I'm just a kid yelling and screaming into a camera in New Jersey, and I can only do so much. You guys are really taking the torch, embracing your inner palate, building your self-esteem, and I'm just honored, humbled, and thrilled to uh, to really be your stepping stone. And so, you know, I'm really excited with that, and with, uh, with that, I, I think I'm gonna show you the first champagne, which is, the Tattinger 2000 Rosé, which I'm in love with, uh, made from Pinot Noir grapes, 170 US dollars. So we're not talking about, you know, peanuts here, but I know most of the Vaniacs roll hard in Vegas. So if you ever do, you can check this out. 93 points, 90 points, 93 points. Josh Reynolds, who you know we have a lot of respect for. Just a, a beautifully colored, you know, almost like a peachy peach color. Uh, let's give it a little bit of a sniffy snip. You know, very fresh, a little rose petal on the nose. Beautiful, like, baking soda meets peach cobbler. And so that peach reference on the color, I don't know if it's kind of going to my nose as well, but it's clearly coming through with baking soda action as well. 
This has consistently been uh, uh, one of my favorite champagnes. Let's give it a whirl. Just the overall complexity of this champagne is stunning. I get completely baffled and for lack of a better word, straight angry when everybody orders Cristal and Dom P and doesn't realize there are so many other luxury cuvées out there that bring the thunder in mounds in comparison. This wine is very complete. It's got very dry, beautiful acidity, beautiful lush apricots and plum action on the mid palate. Finishes long, dry, and acidic, which I love. Just a tremendous champagne. Easily, easily my favorite champagne in the last couple of years. Mod, it's 300, I guess I could. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I drink champagne, it kind of makes me want to do something else. It kind of makes me want to sing. And that's what I've done. I've come to you for the 300th episode. I didn't want to make it wacky, but I've decided that I'm going to sing you a song. So I wrote something special last night with the beats, and here it comes. This is the 300th episode. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the journey has been so long. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a bad idea. That's a real, real bad idea. Listen, I sang the song. I can't wait to see the clips. I guarantee this is my most clippable, linkable episode of Wine Library TV history. Mott's ears are hurting. Listen, this is not a joke episode. This is about wine. This is not about Hulk Hogan's hair. It is not going to be about Hogan's hair. This is not going to be about the New York Jets. It is not going to be about the New York Jets. Today is about you guys having the ability to taste along with me two wines and most importantly, and here's where I think it gets fun, down below we have the links for Corked. And what you're able to do is click that button and review it yourself. So everybody who's got this, I'm gonna review it as well now, but what I'm looking forward to is coming in, you know, Sunday afternoon after my weekend festivities, which include, includes a coin tip, you know, tossing. I love that action, it's a big game, you know, closest quarter to the wall, huge tournament. If you're on 17th and 3rd this weekend, come and join us in that tourney. Anyway, this is about me coming in that night and really checking out how you guys reviewed it, getting the community scoring. You with a little bit of me, remember? I'm only gonna be one review in Cork. So please, if you have a Cork account, or if you don't, sign up and leave your tasting notes and scores. This is where it gets real exciting for me, and let's get right into the first wine. Now this is the Sans Serra 2004 Selección Rioja. 100% Tempranillo, 17 US dollars, one seven. Uh-huh, Tim Dwight action. Um, let's give it a little bit of a pour. Let's give it a little bit of a rinse first. Now let's get real, real focused. You know, I'm just... This is the 300th episode! 300. The journey... No, no, I'm done with that. I promise, no more. I mean, at least half of you have left by now. That is some bad, bad... You know, the singing is really, you know, taste... Uh, anyway, tremendous color. God, I'm having fun with that. Trem I'm gonna do that at least 10 more times, sorry. Tremendous color, really one thing you will recognize, and let's start off with this. You may need to pause right now. These wines have been open for about an hour, so that's where I'm tasting them out. I'm hoping that most of you've rolled in with that kind of time frame. If not, you can pause, come back, or really, you know, you can do whatever the heck you want, really. Uh, but that's where I'm going to. Now, this is from Rioja Alta. Now, there's three sections of Rioja. Uh, the Rioja Baja, the Alta, and the Alavesa, and uh, those are real three region subbreaks within Rioja and the Alta really by word of mouth and by tasting through the years and by pretty much knowledge out there is producing some of the most substantial wines and what I love about this on Serra and why you guys have it is this is this selection meaning they put all the grapes which is 100% Tempranillo in barrels but then as it's going through aging they're going through each barrel and selecting through barrel tastings what they believe to be the top quality wines and then deselect the rest that goes into Crianza. So this is an upper echelon. So this is the creme de la creme for lack of a better word. So I'm excited to really put it in front of you. 13.5% alcohol content. Let's give it a sniffy sniff and let's do this together. One of the keys if you're doing this with me is it's the whirl. I'm telling you this breakdown and getting the oxygen into the glass is essential and imperative. It's going to really allow a lot of the bouquet to pop out and really get directly into your nose and who doesn't like that. So let's give it a little bit of sniffy sniff.
Now, I think a lot of you will recognize and notice there's a very dark chocolate, uh, which is intriguing because we have a little chocolate action today. We'll get into that a little bit today. A little bit of a chocolate aspect, but there's also a really dark cherry component on this wine that I adore. A little bit of a, almost like a slight pepper and really a cre creaminess to it, almost like a Cool Whip whipped cream component on the nose. So, you know, it, it's very attractive on the nose. There is a little bit of Oak Monster in it. That's bothering me a little something something, but not too, too much. Let's give it a whirl. Now what I think a lot of you will recognize on the mouthfeel is that, especially when you're done now, this wine is very dry. And the reason we picked this wine is I was really looking to give you guys a wine that characteristically was very different on the nose and the body. Where it's a very seductive and fruit driven and bakery fresh and very, very kind of sugar driven, you know, fruits and, and candies. The flavor profile is much drier. Um, really, really complex on your palate. Uh, I get almost like a vegetal component coming through. Um, what I really like is that there's um, an austere, like a cranberry-esque component on the palate, which I like quite a bit. Finishes long, but very, very dry. And so the key component to this now is, is I'm sure you have some foods out, especially if you have company. Now, I don't, I have some chocolate. I'm gonna bring that out now, uh, because this is a dark, semi-bitter chocolate. Um, so I'm gonna put that in my palate. What you're gonna see now is, this wine will change, evolve enormously with food in your palate. For me, it now tastes like chocolate and red wine. But on an honest level, what it does is really rounds out those tannins. This wine is young, it's an 04. It's got, it needs something in your palate to kind of let its flavor profile wrap around your palate. That's what this chocolate's doing for me. If you've got meats and cheeses, it will go tremendously well. And really a tremendous experiment and a real eye-opener to how wine reacts by itself or with food. It's a classic food wine and at $17 brings a lot of tradition with a little bit, just a hint, like a uh, of new world love makes a kind of wine that I adore. I mean, it's got, has tremendous complexity. It's a well-rounded wine. There is clearly a bitterness to this wine that I'm extremely curious will throw some people off. Again, back to being a difficult wine to drink by itself. Obviously, I'm spending more time in this wine than we normally do because so many of you, hundreds of you, actually have this bottle in front of you, so I'm excited about that. At the end of the day, that bitterness is a big indication of its youth, the high tannin levels that this wine comes with, and a little bit of its greenness and earthy tones that this wine brings. I'm gonna score this wine 89 plus. I like it a lot. It doesn't have the oomph to go into the 90 point range, but for a $17 bottle of wine, I think it's more than adequate, and I'm being harsh on it by itself like I have to do with every other wine. This is the wine that has huge potential with a steak, uh, really what a steak is really what it's made for, but again, a little pigeon action wouldn't hurt anybody with this wine either. This is a wine that can last for four to six years, and a wine I think brings some very solid thunder. Extremely cloudy out there with this wine, and it's a good effort, I hope you enjoyed that, and I would really love for you to let, let that breathe a little bit longer. If you're gonna have it over the weekend, maybe have it tomorrow, Sunday, I think you will be stunned how this wine evolves over time as the tannins subside and the fruit kicks up. I'm gonna answer a little rounded questions that I've been saving for episode 300. I get asked all the time what your favorite episode is. I just turned on to Wine Library TV, what should I watch? And I have a dark horse, and there's a lot of different reasons why it is. The episode I'd love you to check out, if you haven't, and Mott, link this up, is episode 122. Check that out, I think you're gonna enjoy it. It was an interesting episode for me, I think it was a lot of fun, so definitely do that. Now, let's, uh, let's move on. Now this wine is going to be a lot of fun. Now this is the Linda Flor 2002 Argentinian Malbec. This wine is 30 US dollars, and the winemaker is Michelle Roland, who is very controversial and very famous in his own right. Um, has done some great, great work in Bordeaux. Uh, obviously, Robert Parker tends to like his wines very much. There was a movie come, not too long after Sideways, uh, Mondabino, that uh, shed some light on, on some of his practices, though edited down in a very big way. So, very controversial figure in the wine world. So I'm excited about trying this, especially because it's a Mendoza. 
wine. Uh, Mendoza is really a very intriguing place in Argentina, fourth largest city, producing probably the best wines in the area, commanding very serious prices. It's 30 US dollars. This is not a joke uh, by any stretch of the imagination. 15% alcohol. This is from a single parcel, the Linda Flora, small little vineyard. Um, and I'm really darn excited about trying this wine. The 2003 was a huge hit. The Cantor loved it. Um, this, this is a wine that has enormous pedigree, has tremendous owners with a lot of money, the proper winemaker in place, the right terroir. This has all the elements to be a winner, but is it a Yankees-esque kind of situation or is it more like a Redskins situation? Though the Yankees haven't won in a long time either, so maybe they're both the same situation. Anyway, tremendous color, uh, spectacular, very dark. Malbec has been gaining enormous amounts of attention. Wanted to give you a little bit different style of wine than the other wine in this little two pack. Let's give it a little bit of a sniffy sniff. Now, now you're gonna love this, and, and I know why you're gonna love this. I mean, this is clearly, obviously, like walking on clouds on a beautiful day, hand in hand with strawberry shortcake. It's got that tremendous fluffiness, but beautiful strawberry components, and I mean, big ass strawberries, like the big ones that you only can get at Wegmans for like $98 a piece. They are popping heavily on the nose right now. There's also like a black licorice component on this wine that I adore, and almost like a cassis liqueur component. So you start mixing those together, maybe you got a little, you know, like a, a flask of cassis liqueur in your back pocket. What are you trying to do to strawberry shortcake? You know, so that's really the component with this wine. Um, the nose is fabulous, new world, very explosive. Let's give it a whirl. monster action on this wine. We had to give you a little oak monster, but it's not too bad. This is not an overly oaked wine. What you're gonna sense here is, you're gonna see a very clear cut difference from the last wine. This wine is extremely coating of your palate. I mean, it is really like when Rad Racer, when that car would like do the oil spill, and you, you know, it's like that oil spill directly all over your palate because it coats it tremendously. This wine has completely taken over my palate. It's vanilla action is completely out of control. and its weight is tremendous. The body weight of this wine is spectacular. Once again though, you're gonna see how this wine finishes a little bit harsh, getting a little heat. Not a little puff the dragon, but a little tiny bitterness, almost a green-esque mix with a little alcohol action. 15% is a big boy. Once again, you're kinda seeing where I veered episode 300 to. Go to your foods now, especially cheeses and meats. I'm gonna go with a little bit of uh, what is this? Milk chocolate. Because I like milk chocolate. Give it a whirl. Not as good as a pairing as the last wine. I feel like they're beating each other up a little bit. But once again, as your palate gets coated with other products, foods, cheeses would be tremendous in this scenario. Meats, you're gonna notice that the tannins are going to subside a little bit and the wine's gonna become a little bit more velvety. And so really where I wanted to go with this was my overall theme of why I even do Wine Library TV and I thought 300 would be a good, good time to do that. People taste wines in so many different emotional and emotional settings and really just settings in general, meaning when I taste the wines on Wine Library TV, I'm tasting them, analyzing them, doing for you, by themselves with no foods. Many of you have had these same wines when you agree and or disagree with foods in front of you. And that's going to be a big factor as you've just learned. How about mentality? Some days I am thrilled. Mondays after the Jets win. Some days I am angry. Mondays after the Jets lose. Mindset is huge. Mindset is huge in everything. And so what we ultimately have to concur to is number one, ratings suck. Do not believe them. Not me, not Parker, not Spectator. The only ratings that should mean anything to you are your own ratings. Number two, embracing and understanding mindset in the factor of analyzing wines and life in general. It's always what point of view you're looking at. And number three, not taking anything too serious. I mean, I love this. I got an email yesterday from a guy 
They were mad about the fact that I scored the Kobe on Cabernet 69 points, Parker 92 points. I got emails from the wineries. They want me to retry the wine, and I will because the pedigree is there. But one of my viewers emailed Appalachian America, Napa Valley correspondent, and the guy wrote back that basically he doesn't listen to my, he doesn't know who I am, but and doesn't listen to my flimsy reviews. I thought that was kind of funny. You know, it's just another clear example of where the wine world is. What we need to realize is that unless you can embrace your inner self, Remember what you like. Everybody's always asking me, how do I figure out what wine when I go to a store to pick, to like? You're not gonna be able to tell by the label. If it's pretty, if it's ugly, and you can go by the scores, but again, ratings are subjective. So how do you do that? You build your own personal wine library. You know, you have to start writing down things you want. Go with technology. Technology's here. Use the iPhone, use your phone, text yourself. Start building your own personal library. Start trusting yourself. And I promise you, in 60 days, 120 days, and especially in a year, you will absolutely know what you like, how you like it. But always remember, trying different things is always going to be the key to making wine work for you. Always buy one bottle you like and one bottle you don't like. And heck, if you really want to do it, always buy wines. Did I say bottle you don't like? Meaning bottle you haven't tried yet. Um, Always experimenting on different wines is the key. That has been the mission for Wine Library TV. Opening your eyes to different wines, trying different things. I I hope this little experiment with very young wines that clearly are easily uh, adaptive around foods and change directly will really open your eyes just a tad. Um, I really hope that you put in your tasting notes into corked because if everybody does it, we'll see how everybody looks at different things. And most of all, I really hope that you watch the next 300 episodes, if we do a lot. And don't forget, next Wednesday is the huge, huge announcement that we've been talking about for almost a year. So finally, I just want to thank everybody for everything. I am obnoxiously humbled to be a part of this. And uh, you, with a little bit of me, we are changing the wine world.